Hello, I'm Elizabeth Nosick, Curator of Education and Exhibits here at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Over the last few weeks, we have showcased various objects in our collection. One of the more thought-provoking sub-collections at the museum is our Telegraph Collection. Given its role in railroad history, it seemed appropriate to give some attention to these objects today. I will provide a quick overview of the Telegraph and its relationship to the railroad. Next, I'll show you some of the Telegraph items from our permanent collection before visiting the Telegraph office here at the museum. When Samuel Morse sent the first telegraph message from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. in 1844, it wasn't a new idea. In fact, six years earlier, in 1838, 62 people claimed that they had invented the first electrical telegraph. What made Morse stand out from the pack? He was the first to get political backing from Congress for his telegraph, and he created a business model for making it work. Prior to the telegraph, it could take days, weeks, and even months for messages to be sent from one location to another very distant place. In fact, the Pony Express used horse-mounted relays to deliver messages, newspapers, and mail, and they lasted just 18 months before the telegraph replaced them. The 20-day record for travel between the Atlantic and Pacific coast was cut to 10 days by the Pony Express. Once the transatlantic telegraph was completed in October of 1861, messages could be almost instantaneous. The world had become a much smaller place. Another invention making the world smaller was the railroad. In the United States, the railroad opened vast new areas of the American interior to settlement while stimulating the mining of coal for fuel and the manufacture of iron for locomotives and rails. The ability to communicate quickly and effectively over these long distances was essential to the country's settlement. In 1860, some 16 years since the first telegraph message between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., some 50,000 miles of telegraph wire had been strung. Initially, the telegraph was a service for businesses rather than individuals, but it would play a strategic role during the Civil War. Commanders were able to communicate with their troops almost instantly, and anxious families could hear the news of battles mere hours instead of the weeks it had taken in the past. After the Civil War, telegraphy advanced even more quickly with the railroad. The telegraph and the railroad were natural partners in commerce. The telegraph needed the right-of-way that the railroads provided, and the railroads needed the telegraph to coordinate the safe arrival and departure of trains. These synergies were not immediately recognized. Only in 1858 did railways start to use telegraphy. Prior to that, telegraph wires strung along the tracks were seen as a nuisance, occasionally sagging and causing accidents and even fatalities. So after the Civil War, not only railroads, but also telegraph lines had to be strung across a vast continent. The use of telegraphy advanced with the advancement of the railroad because the telegrapher's primary duty was maintaining communication. The telegrapher copied train orders and messages for the train crews and reported to the dispatcher the passing of trains. He was basically the eyes and ears of the train dispatcher. Here in Colorado, the first telegraph was in Julesburg, which was also the first town to be served by a railroad. The first telegraph in Colorado reached Julesburg in August of 1861. Telegrams were received from and sent to Julesburg by stagecoach for two years until a branch line built to Denver opened for business in October of 1863. Telegraph keys are electrical on and off switches used to send messages in Morse code. The message travels as a series of electrical pulses through the wire and activates a register or sounder at the receiving end. Operators used keys with up and down or back and forth switches. It was a personal preference for them as to which they prefer. Operators receiving messages were able to determine who was on the other end sending the message by their accent or how they hit that key. Just as important as the key, a telegraph sounder acted as a receiver for telegraph lines in the 19th century. It was invented in the 1850s in the effort to make the Morse code messages more audible to the receiving operator. 
Now, putting sounders in wooden boxes, known as resonators, further enhanced reception for the operator. Oral tradition tells us that many operators even placed their tobacco can, most famously Prince Albert tobacco, and used it as an amplifier. Both of these sounders were made by Western Union, and this one is even inscribed as W.U. Tell Co. backslash M.L. Sounder 17-A30, right here. When you put the key and sounder together, you have what is called a key on board, or KOB for short. It is probably what we think of when we discuss telegraphs and what was standard in the business. Telegraph operators could be itinerant, moving from place to place, following where work took them. Because they became used to how their keys and sounders worked, many telegraphers preferred to own their own equipment and would travel with them. The most convenient way to make this work was to mount the key on a base. An even more common arrangement was to mount the key and the sounder on a single base. The KOBs varied. They could be made of chrome, brass, steel, or a combination of all of the above. The knob on the key handle was more often or not an early Bakelite, and that was popular up through World War II. Bases could be made out of wood or metal. With the invention of the telegraph, there was suddenly a need to run wires on poles for many miles. How to attach the wires safely to the poles and prevent the signal from draining into the earth whenever the wire touched a solid object created the need for insulators. Insulators have been made out of many things, including porcelain, animal parts, rubber, wood, and plastic. The most popular material associated with them, though, is glass. Insulators can be a variety of different colors. Clear and aqua are considered the default colors, but most insulators come out a little green because of the iron content in the glass. Signal insulators are those that carried railroad signals, and they could be ordered specifically in blue, green, or amber. This was a big help when you had a pole with a lot of insulators on it. You could determine which colors carried which circuits, and that made your job much easier. Now, this particular green glass insulator dates to the 1890s. It is threaded so it could easily screw on to the metal arm bracket, which was then attached to the pole. The top is known as a butterfly top because it made it easier to screw onto the metal bracket. So later on, manufacturers found clear insulators to be much more practical because they attracted fewer bugs and they heated up less. This clear glass insulator has been paired with this wooden bracket. We know that this was made after 1865 because this is when they first started making the threaded insulators. Once screwed onto the wooden bracket, it would then be attached directly onto the pole. The integral connection between the telegraph and railroad is why one of the museum's longest running exhibits is that of our telegraph office. It was set up by Gil Fuller, who passed away in 2019. And there's a lot to see in this exhibit. So for the purpose of this particular segment, we're gonna focus on the items we discussed earlier. An operator sits at the desk and it was his job to receive and send dispatches, train orders and their confirmations and communications to and from the dispatcher and other operators along the line by telegraph and later on telephone. Train orders were initially disseminated from the dispatcher to the stations along the line by telegraph. Samuel F. B. Morse first demonstrated a successful telegraph line in 1844 and a railroad owned telegraph system was first used exclusively for dispatching trains by the Pennsylvania Railroad in Pittsburgh in 1854. The telegraph system used by railroads required the use of only one wire running from station to station. The circuit return was earth ground and the entire circuit was powered by batteries. An operator sending a message would make and break the circuit with his telegraph key. There are a few examples of keys or KOBs in our diorama. You can also see a couple of examples of sounders at the operator's desk, complete with a Prince Edward tobacco tin to help amplify the messages being sent. The information was coded in short dots, long dashes, longer dashes, and time-spaced intervals. This was the original American Morse code used by the railroads, and it differs from the international Morse code commonly used in radio transmission. Our operator is sending the original American Morse code used by the railroads. 
In the window on the left-hand side, you can see some examples of insulators. I would like to leave you with this quote from the 1858 book by Charles Briggs and Augusta Maverick entitled, The Story of the Telegraph. Of all the marvelous achievements of modern science, the electric telegraph is transcendentally the greatest and most serviceable to mankind. It is impossible that old prejudices and hostilities should longer exist while such an instrument has been created for an exchange of thought between all the nations of the earth. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our small wonders. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.